Hey, you're listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm your co-host, Mark. And I am your co-host, Josh, daring to open the lament configuration. Uh, you were far too excited for this one. <laughs> Dude, this was my like most anticipated movie of this year, and... Uh, I will get into my feelings on this movie, but David Bruckner is one of my favorite directors working today. With you talking about Southbound VHS, uh, uh, the ritual, uh, this movie or the night house, we'll get into it. I know this is going to be very polarizing and I, I might be alone in this, this, uh, this episode, but that's fine. Uh, I am joined while well, we are joined on this episode by a, uh, independent filmmaker who has a short film called death in a box, which is now making its way around the circuit festival, the festival circuit. Uh, he is uh, known to uh, people by Mr. Uh, Simeon Gregory. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, doing as good as I can be. I'm recovering from uh, fighting off a cold, but uh, thanks for having me. So absolutely. I I think you might actually be surprised on this one when we get down to it. I'll just say that much now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh before we jump into uh David Bruckner's reimagining of Hellraiser, which is what we're gonna be talking about this episode. I got a chance to see this film uh, at one of the festivals that it circulated, which was Creature Feature Weekend, which we put out um, episodes and videos for. So make sure that you guys uh, check those out wherever you guys uh, get your podcast from. And then it's YouTube.com forward slash victims and villains. This movie feels like a perfect companion piece uh, to, ha to have on the uh, uh, an episode about Hellraiser, which has a lot of mythology. Uh, based around a box, as does this one. Uh, can you guys talk about what death in a box is? Well, it's uh, it's basically uh, 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 my little love note to to the genre itself. Uh, my favorite genre, um, I believe. Um, it's I, the thing I love about horror itself is it's uh, it's an open sandbox to nightmares, and uh, there are very little if actually no rules that you have to play by. Um, and it basically comes down to um, a struggle between two friends, uh, the conflict, um, which I try to make very clear that there's, there's some type of conflict going on. Um, and this box comes in between the, it tests the friendship of the, the two girls. Um, and you guys are the first ones to kind of like, um, well, I don't know if it was on purpose or not, but bringing on Hellraiser, it was definitely a a little <laughs> tiny bit of inspiration for my box as far as what what is this what is this box? Um, where did it come from? What does it do? Uh, what does it do to me or to whatever the world around me? Um, yeah, I I can see it felt like there was a little bit of an influence there with the way the whole um, short kind of played out um revolving around the box and the 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 messages and everything going on with the box it kind of felt like there was a little nod there to hellraiser and the limit configuration and everything yeah just a tiny bit um <laughs> I, I draw from uh i drew just a tiny bit from hellraiser um it follows um when i grew up watching the twilight zone with my dad and stuff like that so um those are just little little bits of influences i threw in there um yeah. i i'm probably the only one that like actually has ever like made this comparison but uh i love horror and i but i'm a, i'm a nerd at heart and uh one of the things that like visually uh this move like the box it kind of looks like it reminds me of the the mother box from Zack Snyder's Justice League. Oh. <laughs> and I don't know if you've heard that yet, but no. uh, it's kind of, it's kind of like this uh, like visually it's it's weird because it's it's essentially like a box that floats in the middle of this uh, like abandoned countryside that spits out like fortune cookie like fortunes ask i don't know it's like really weird to describe it kind of looks like uh like tar but there's like it's possessed by an entity 
Yeah, it's a fortune cookie from hell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it it it, it, it reminds so. I thought of what is it the Zoltan Zoltar machine from Big? Oh, <laughs> nice <laughs> crossed with Hellraiser. Yeah, with the with the yeah, that's what I thought. It's so consciously, that that could be a little bit there because I I I I love Big. Um, I remember seeing it in theaters as a, as a kid. Uh, there could be a little bit subconscious influence that that made its way in there. From <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I. I, I really loved this film. I loved how like simple it is, but like uh, one of the things too, that I think this film does really well, that uh, it's kind of some of my love hate relationship with short films is the way that they can kind of leave you uh, wanting more. And this film definitely kind of made me want more. Is there one of, th- one of the questions I love to ask uh, di- short film directors is this story. Is there any plans or any chances of this kind of becoming a feature length film at one point, any point? So this kind of like uh, it was a germ of a, an idea. So originally, just the the box itself was my starting point. Um, some people start at different places or whatever, but mine usually comes from like a, like a little a little germ, um, and then it just grows uh, from there. But uh, when I wrote it, I was I structured it as short film for this one. It's, this is my first. Um, it's actually my first film, um, so I, I took a long time um studying i've been writing for a long time but uh i just took my time i was like oh i want to kind of like dab um just dip a little bit into filmmaking and um it was a very rewarding process and i've got the bug um and i would i could turn this into a feature so i left it i left a lot of written ideas on the side enough definitely enough content uh for a feature i could probably turn it into like a Mm, probably like a good like 80 90 minutes uh i'd want to keep it pretty brisk um but yes um if 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 it was ever presented to me and somebody was like i will give you money to make this feature i would be like (laughs) yes okay (laughs) well i mean that's how lights out came about it started off as a short they've got real famous it was like a five minute short or something so it's not unheard of to see something like that happen. For sure. Yeah. Uh, most people don't know this, but before he directed Spider-Man, uh, John Watts actually had a movie uh, called Clown that is vastly underrated. And uh, he it basically like they put this like sh- short film that was like a mock trailer online and slapped Eli Roth's name on it. He had no association with it, and the movie just went... Like, the short film went viral, and that's how he ended up actually getting a, a full-length uh, movie out of it. Yeah, Clown was interesting, to say the least. I actually haven't seen that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Uh, it's, it's it is strange. very weird. <laughs> I, I Also with this, I just kind of... Um, I was like, nobody, as a first time filmmaker, nobody's going to give me money. I didn't even bother to ask for money. I was like, nobody's going to give me money to make a uh, a film when they don't even know my my resume, <laughs> like what I can and can't do and stuff like that. So I just, I just saved up and I did it myself. And I was like, well, this is maybe one way of getting in there. Um, and even if it just becomes something as more of something just for fun, I'm still um, wanting to do it. But if it goes somewhere... That's awesome, because uh, uh, that's I would love to. I'd love to give my my day job the middle finger. No, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, isn't that the dream? I think that's that's kind of like we're all we all are. Um, it, no, like I when I was like preparing for this episode and like going back and, and rewatching this short, um, I didn't realize this was actually your first film. And so, like, uh, being the director of our film festival, um, this is a really impressive debut. Um, like, just just the way that, like, not even necessarily for the content wise, but just the way that it it looks, like, it has a really uh, warm hue about it. Color palettes really uh, pops really well. Uh, cinematography is really good. Uh, what was the process like? kind of get that visual style uh to actually stand out um so it was all built out of 
the valley that I live in, uh, Yakima Valley, as far as like, um, it's desert valley. Um, I, I wanted to keep that, that same kind of, uh, color palette as you mentioned which uh good eye on that as far as even even interior shots as well as far as some of the colors i wanted uh, to stay the same even came down to like the the bedding and the the decor which uh, my art director which is uh my fiance madison she did a a really good job and most of it was just just her style anyway so <laughs> she was like <laughs> she was just doing her regular normal thing um and I met with uh, Joe Greening. He's uh, uh, he's uh, out of Colorado, uh, and he, I met with him many, many times over Zoom. We prepped, and uh, I even went out to different locations, uh, showed him, took pictures, took little videos. Hey, this is where I'm. This is where I want the the shot to be. I think it's beautiful outdoor stuff he's like oh yeah that's gonna that's gonna be awesome and we just kind of like went through it and i created a shot list um but it all kind of just came into place um it was that part of it was a little bit i wouldn't say luck i would say i definitely wanted it to look uh very similar but it, it just ended up just falling more into place than i thought it was going to uh, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. The the smaller kind of producers and directors, there's always the yeah, my friend, my fiance, my brother kind of ends up working their way into the script or set or production somehow. Yeah. I I oh I wore uh I wore many hats for this, <clears throat> uh that's for sure. But any help I could get uh was greatly appreciated. It was a very small crew of of five a steady steady three or four and an occasional five in there but um as uh right i wrote it directed it produced it um uh, helped write the um the song for it the end, during the ending credits i uh um went through created all the shot listing uh created all the the call sheets. Uh, I was like, I, I, I went in there just as far as, uh, I learned as much as I could about cinematography as well, which, uh, my DP Joe Greening, he was amazing. We were on the same page by the time it was ready to shoot. It was just like, yep, yep, yep. We didn't even really have to talk much. Yep. We talked about this. Oh yeah. Uh, every once in a while I'd be like, let's try something different. Or he'd be like, let's try, let's, what do you think about this? Um, and we kind of just ran with it. Um, but yeah, it was, um, it was just a very rewarding process, but very heavy, um, cause I had a lot of jobs to do on there. Um, I, I couldn't even tell you like all the stuff that we had to go through. <laughs> I was like, it's, it's, uh, it was, it was so much fun that, uh, there's a little, there's, but there's a tiny bit of trauma in there too, as far as I <laughs> had too much, just, just, just but, a little bit like. Yeah. That's what I'd say. This is the interesting thing about like uh, in DIY, like filmmaking and like content creating is like you are wearing many hats. Like you said, like you were scouting out things. You were learning about uh, cinematography, co-writing the like the music. Like, yeah, it's it's definitely an experience uh, kind of doing something like this. It is. And I think it helps out the more, you know, so and I, I knew I knew enough to be dangerous with sound and uh just enough to uh to film cinematography wise um which it paid off because we lost we actually lost uh, day one of our footage which uh was recorded over but it was only shots exterior shots of the box so um after everybody was gone i was able to go back out there and uh with the help of my sister lugging stuff around and and helping with the slime pouring the slime on the uh the box <laughs> I was able to get exposure just right and shoot it during the golden hour and get some really good close-ups of the slime just dripping off of it. So that's the spot, the what you see um, of the the close-ups and the slime dripping of the box. That's all what I shot. Uh, nice. Well, uh, tell our can you tell our listeners where they can uh, find upcoming appearances that this uh, film is going to be playing at. 
Yeah, so the the best way right now is to follow me on Instagram, Simeon underscore Gregory, or just go to deathinabox.film. And I have, I I try to update it weekly. I have a list of all the screenings, uh, the upcoming, I have a trailer on there. Um, Yeah, so I've just got basically all the information, but yeah, I would say Instagram and the website. All right, well, we will provide links for that in the show notes below. Uh, Mark, you were absolutely right at the beginning of the show. I am way too excited to be talking <laughs> about this movie. Uh, yeah, before we jump into this movie, I am kind of curious to just to gauge for myself, I guess, like where what Hellraiser as a franchise uh, kind of means to you guys and, and kind of like uh, what your relationship is with the films, the books, etc. Uh, so, Mark, where what about you, my friend? I mean, I've been, I've seen the films for years, especially one and two. Um, They kind of, after one and two, progressively got worse the more they took Clive Barker out of it. Um, Although Judgment was really good. I did really enjoy Judgment, um, which was the last one they did. But I mean, Pinhead's just iconic of a character and some super big shoes for anybody to fill after the original actor so i didn't have much hope for the for the new one going into it i came in with low expectations i'm excited to see if it exceeded those expectations uh but uh simeon what about you my friend um i i i love the series itself um yeah growing up with hellraiser uh the cenobites scared the scared the crap out of me um just terrifying in a way is this they're just they're there watching you they they don't even they don't come after you you know like the traditional like slasher where it's like or a monster movie it's like after you after you they're there they know they're there they know their power um and, and something about that and the the mystery of the box always drew me in for sure the first two are my uh are my favorite um i actually enjoyed bloodline uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, i actually really did it's like one of my guilty pleasures of the the franchise um and i went in i went in actually not expecting much um other than uh david i'm a huge fan the night house is my favorite movie of uh of last year um so um it was last year right yeah my- it was it was it was also one of my favorites of last year so yeah okay i was like with with everything that's been going on, my years are all just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it I was it was my favorite, and uh, I and I I also watched his other stuff like the Ritual as well, and uh, I think he had part of like some of the VHS stuff or whatever. But uh, but it was all about after the Night House. I'm sold. Anything he does, I'll watch. But uh, not I didn't I didn't have huge expectations, uh, and I don't hold on to uh, uh, Pinhead itself as a thing when i found out it was a reboot and not like and not like a remake or anything like that i was like great let's just see where it goes i if you guys have listened to past episodes we've done in franchises in the past you guys probably know that i have a tendency to over prepare for episodes like this <laughs> Uh, so I, I went back, like, like I said, this was, was much like, much like you, Simeon, like I loved the, the night house last year. Uh, it was one of my top five favorite films of last year. And, uh, I like dove, I came out, I remember coming out of the night house and just diving into literally everything Bruckner had ever touched. Um, whether that was VHS, uh, Southbound ritual, like I jumped in, like I wanted as much of that man's filmography as i could consume and i've seen everything he's put out with the exception of signal um i haven't watched it yet i know it's i know it's streaming out there for free i just haven't made time to do it yet uh which was his his debut but um yeah this was by far my most anticipated uh movie of this year you guys can't see this visually right now. I am wearing a, a Hellraiser t-shirt. I got Pinhead tattooed on me a couple weeks ago. Uh, I have uh, a Pinhead flag in my my background. I reread uh, Hellbound Heart, Scarlet Gospels uh, in anticipation. Rewatched all 10 movies. Um, 
So I'm coming into this like fully prepared and uh, I probably had the highest expectations out of everyone, not necessarily because of this being finally, for those of you guys that, that may or may not know, this uh, this particular reboot or reimagining has been in the works since 2006. Um, back when the Weinsteins were at the, still had the, the rights to it, they were trying to get this developed forever. And yeah, had, that is, I had actually seen some of the early makeup designs and test footage for the reimagining of Pinhead. Yeah. And so this is the kind of, uh, that's also the kind of reason that something like, uh, Hellraiser revelations exists, uh, is because that movie was basically made so that they could maintain the rights because they they had like gone so long without making one then they're like oh hey our literally in two weeks if we don't make another hellraiser movie the rights revert back um and you know so that's kind of why that movie feels the way that it does uh but this movie i was not in i did not have high expectations because this was going to be the hellraiser reboot finally coming out i had high expectations because of Bruckner coming out of Nighthouse last year, like just the way that it it weaves in themes and like other dimensions and like parallel realities. Like I was like, this is the perfect man to bring this story to life. For me, it was more of Clive Barker being involved was like the only hope that I too. had was the only hope I had of it possibly being good was the fact that Clive Barker was involved with it again yeah I, I i i don't know about defending it but anytime somebody would be like eh it's, it's going straight it's going on hulu or or whatever i would just oh i'm a i'm a huge david bruckner fan and uh i'm just and then when i knew also clive barker was uh, had a little bit involved in it too i was like oh yeah and then diving a little bit after watching the night house um and hearing that he kind of tweaked it i heard I don't know if you guys know the fact on this because uh, I don't just like saying stuff that I haven't done research on, but this is just something I've heard that he, originally the night house was um, written more as like a, a Hellraiser, um, And then he, he changed it because he couldn't get the, they wouldn't let him make it as a Hellraiser movie. I, I can 100% see that. Like it, it feels like a cousin, uh, of the Hellraiser franchise, the way that it kind of builds its lore and stuff like that. Like, I, I definitely can see and understand that. I got done with the new one, watching the new one. And the first thing that came to mind was, I think, in the second one, they had mentioned that there were, I think, six puzzle boxes and only three were found. And the first thing I thought after watching this one was that it was one of the missing six puzzle boxes. So again, I probably <laughs> way over prepared for this episode, but there is a scene in judgment where there's a mantle where you see all six configurations. Um, but that, that, mantle, again, that mantle is also yeah. in the Cenobites house. It is. Uh, it is not the, in the real world. 54. That so that 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 house that they use in Judgment is the house from the first one. Didn't know that. Yes, it's uh I don't remember the exact address. It's like fifty five something. I I don't know. Um, but I am am curious to hear where you guys ended up. I think I think all of my feelings for this movie are kind of like showing through. So, uh, Mark, Dude, what did you think of this yeah, movie? You had like a daily countdown for two weeks. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I turned around, I was like, nine days till Hellraiser's coming. It's like, dude, dude, chill. You're setting yourself up for disappointment. I went in with extremely low expectations just because I'm familiar with all the sequels. Um, like I said, Judgment, to me, Judgment was the best of all the sequels after like number three. Um, but I went in with low expectations all the way around. And it was good. I, I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I had a few small issues. Um, but it, it, it was a lot better than I thought it was going to be. 
If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth, so please stay with us. All right, Simeon, where where you, where you landed? <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I, I hate the fact that um, I kind of like mentally score a movie after I watch it. I want to get away from that. And especially after being a filmmaker, I freaking hate that now. As far as like, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I just mentally, oh yeah, this is like, this is this. I, after watching it, I in my head, it was like a 7 out of 10. Um, and then the more I thought about it, the more I like it. Um, which I'm sure when I watch it a second time, um, that'll go up even higher. But um, the just the more I think about it, uh, just certain things he threw in there and i love everything down to just certain uh dialogue or phrases uh can we throw out a little bit of dialogue or oh please oh, okay I, so, I took notes and then have dialogue written yeah, down okay. so knock so yourself is out this, is this is the spoiler <laughs> warning uh, yeah we're gonna we're gonna do spoilers right now go for it <laughs> okay uh, the boyfriend, when he's, uh, I believe he's behind the bar and he says, uh, what's your pleasure, ma'am? I was like, oh, <laughs> just uh, little things, little nods like that. Yeah, I, obviously the the big like, uh, I mean, it was the it was the trail. It was the the tagline for the original film is uh, demons to some angels, angels to others. I love the the spin that they throw in this one where they go to meet with Serena and she's like, uh, angels, he called them. You think a devil would recognize a devil? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> just so, go ahead. Oh, I'm just he you could tell you could tell he's uh he's passionate about the Hellraiser franchise. So I I'm I just right away i'm automatically gonna enjoy it because if somebody's passionate about something i'm gonna enjoy it but uh yeah <laughs> so okay one of my th was the dialogue that was one of the things i had an issue with not like horribly like oh god this sucks but pinhead's dialogue to me was not as epic as it was in the originals when doug bradley was doing it not just because it was him his voice played a role in the lines, but some of the lines he had originally, um, oh, what was it? Um, something along. Uh, uh, Save your tears. Yeah, it, such a waste of good pleasure, something like that. Good, whatever, suffering. Uh, Please, but, no yeah. tears. It's a waste of yeah. good suffering. Yeah, things like that. It just, pinheads in this one, just, wasn't quite as good and it didn't have that stand out you know who it is immediately 
when when she would start speaking in this one for me. First off, let me let me press up against that and <laughs> and and play the advocate here because I I think that this movie feels so much more refreshing because when you look at the original Hellraiser, we know Pinhead because of Doug Bradley. Right. And most people may or may not know this, but the reason that he has all the good dialogue in that movie is because the actors that were playing the Chatterer and um, the de- technical term is vagina neck, uh, <laughs> they they couldn't actually speak. So that's the reason why uh, they couldn't speak in the makeup. The makeup, the latex for it was too much for them to do. So that's the reason why uh, Doug Bradley kind of became the face for it to not only appease the movies of the the that era, whether he, because everyone had to have a face, whether it was you know Michael, Freddie, Jason, Leatherface, Chucky, um, they had to have a, a face of the franchise. So that's the reason why he became it. What I think Bruckner and and Luke and and Ben, the the two writers on this movie, they do so well is they 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 break that. You yes, you're coming to see Jamie Clayton as Pinhead. That's the reason why you're going to tune in. But I think this movie, what it does really smart is it allows the other Cenobites to have their own time to shine. It's and, not just about Pinhead. And that's 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 right. I'm not saying she did a bad job or was presented poorly. And the others, yeah, they, they never talked to any of the originals. It was just him. But it was such a big portrayal role to fill i don't think anybody could have done it with the emphasis that he did and that's that was part of it and the epic lines he had originally but she didn't do a bad job that's not what i'm saying at all she did a decent job it just it's one of those roles like you've got was it bill scarscar just finished up recording the crow it's not gonna be brandon lee no matter how good it is, it's not going to be Brandon Lee's crow. So it's the same kind of thing here. No matter how good of a job she did, it's not going to be the original pinhead. Yeah, it's very large shoes to fill for sure. And nobody can touch yeah. Doug Bradley. And I mean, now that the internet and all that stuff, everybody's like Doug Bradley forever. And it's, uh, uh, it is a thing. Um, but I, I feel like her screen presence was still very strong. Her dialogue wasn't, but her screen presence definitely was. Um, I, I like that was something else is I like the way if you really paid attention to specifically her outfit. It's the original outfit, but instead of being patent leather and latex, it's skin. The actual layout is almost identical when they show her hands even the hands have the skin down two fingers and then the other two fingers are bloody where he had the latex on the two fingers and then the skin showing so the the costume was almost identical but it's skin instead of patent leather and they did that with the other um cenobite that had like the hood over her head and stuff was very similar in the way her, well, the gasp yeah hers was, that's her name hers was very similar to her counterpart um in the same angelique respect. yeah I, I forget all their names i have a bad memory but <laughs> angelique not sure. is one of my favorites <laughs> dude right <laughs> sorry <laughs> the matter was an interesting take not sure how I felt about that one, but they were the Cenobites were were done really well for being a reimagining of the series. I just I thought it was interesting that Pinhead's outfit was essentially the same outfit, but it was skin instead of patent leather. It's definitely more. Uh, it was a more modern take on the Cenobites. I feel like. Yeah, and I liked how they showed how Cenobites are created. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so like i mean we've seen cenobites created before in hellraiser 3 that's really and also hellraiser 4 um because you have the two security guards that become weirdly one. tangled up into one another and I think uh they, but, they talk about chatter's creation i think in the comics yes yes they do um 
and and you you also kind of get to see how uh Elliot Spencer becomes pinhead that we know from the original continuity continuity in uh parts two and three but uh i i think you know kind of going off of what you were saying and like also Simeon, what you're saying about like how they look very modern i i feel like a lot of the way that the cinnabites looked in the original film and this is not like any shade at the production design at any of those the the first you know 10 movies is like they all looked like they were never a, a part of the the same like i the, the best way i could describe it is they never looked like they were uh part of like an order um they never looked like they were supposed to be part of like the re- religious sect which is if you know the what the word cenobite means it it actually uh, comes from a word that means like a religious gathering or something along those lines and like the way that like the book uh, heart, hellbound heart portrays it is that it's like it's a it's a closely knit um like like selection of, of demons and uh it's supposed to be like the order they gash and then like uh scarlet gospels talks about the order in hell and i felt like with the design and and how like they they made uh roll in at the end you know kind of into the cinnabite and kind of how like they inverted the flesh like it made every it made all the cinnabites feel more connected and the fact that we didn't necessarily focus exclusively on clayton's pinhead we kind of got to build up into it uh whereas i felt like the gasp got to have you know her moments to shine and then you also had the chatterer had his moments to shine uh you had the the weeper had uh her moment to shine and like it built itself up to make pinhead the the ultimate kind of force at the end of the day well for you know the man? most part they got more screen time e- each of the different cinnabites got a lot more previously they kind of walked out of a shadow and turned around and uh, for the most part with the exception of a few scenes so they have a lot more shared screen time as characters instead of just pinhead being the main guy doing stuff and talking yeah, I <laughs> I don't have uh as far as the, their screen time, I I definitely agree with that. Um there were a couple of times where I wanted a little bit more as far as like uh for a Cinnabite to to do maybe just a little bit extra and with their personality. Um but there's that those just a few times where I like, oh, I want to see I want to I want to dive a little bit f- more into this, but of course, you run there's runtime issues and all that stuff. Um the the only i would say the only thing that which is it is explainable that my only little thing about the cenobites itself is uh they were able they were able to be used as a sacrifice um which was interesting but the priest the priest uh penhead kind of was entertained by that and allowed it it seemed like like oh I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's such an interesting uh, di- dynamic that this movie presents with its um, its its sacrifice rule, which um, I don't know if you guys want to get into it, but it just kind of seems like a natural progression where it's like the in the the original films, like the 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 lament configuration was basically like you would like you know kind of twist the top of it and like. It would come apart and then reassemble. Then boom, you had a gate to to hell would open up, uh, or another dimension, however you want to look at it. And this one, there was six like configurations it had to go through before kind of granting the audience with Leviathan at the end. And then like if you made it through and like made six full sacrifices, you would get. Uh, a wish and they had uh six full things you had the first step was lament you got life second one was love you got knowledge uh the third one was uh laundrance you got to live uh liminal was the fourth stage with sac- uh sensation five was lazarus and you could bring like you could resurrect someone then six was um uh leviathan and you would get power and it would like grant you a um 
grant you an audience as they said with with god kind of like the the order of their realm and um but how did you guys kind of feel about the uh like the evolution of the box and the mythos and the way this movie kind of handled that uh, that's what i said that's that's part of why i was like huh it's just one of the missing six boxes that it's just a different box I I loved it. Um, I love the 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 evolution and the the transformation of uh, the configuration itself. Um, uh, I was like, I I started thinking about it. You just started mentioning also also that uh, about you know like six configurations, uh, six sacrifices. I was like, huh, six configurations, six sacrifices, six gifts. Uh, six sides to a box and then i was like what does <laughs> it's very interesting <laughs> how uh, <laughs> i was like okay yeah an audience with the the god leviathan um the the gifts are are very interesting um which they're very in gin like yeah as far as you know like be careful what you wish for yeah, this is your gift, and you can't you can't give it back. You can you can kind of like get another one. You can exchange it if you're worthy. I I felt like that was like the the one of the rules. I uh, can't give it back a gift, but you can exchange it if you're worthy. Um, I, are you, I like are you familiar? One. Are you familiar with the gin? Uh, enough to to know about it. Yeah, yeah, but Gosh. not. I I've never like delved deeply into it, but uh, uh I I. They don't really make too many. I I remember I was a kid watching Wishmaster. This is off topic. Wishmaster and then uh, um, is it Under the Shadow? There was one that came out. It was a foreign film a few years ago. That was a pretty good one about a gin. Well, well, they're essentially um, what the genies are based on. So Wishmaster kind of touches on it, but it's, uh, um, I believe, Middle Eastern lore that talks about the djinn and it's, it's what the genies were, were based on. And they were more along the lines of, of the dude and Wishmaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you wished for something, it was kind of like an evil twist to it. So yeah, I could, I could make the connection with the gifts of the, of the puzzle box in this movie to the djinn. Cause there was, there was like a sick twist to all of it pretty much. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think like you're just saying, like there's a natural uh, evolution uh, to it that like, it just kind of feels like a natural extension of like where you would where you would take a very modern take on this this uh this mythology and you know i think it's interesting too that like with the the ronan voigt character in particular like here you have a guy that uh that he even monologues about it in the last act that when he's kind of like revealing himself to uh try to like plead for an audience with leviathan again after the commit the configuration's almost done he says you know i i i sw- I, w- I chased after all that money could buy and you know i, I chased out every pleasure which 
is fascinating because it's almost kind of like a uh, mirror image of Frank from the original movie and uh, uh, book where here you have a guy that like literally chased out every single pleasure that he could find under the sun and nothing satisfied him or like everything would just be like uh temporary to where you would eventually like become numb and it's kind of seems like that's the way that that roland had kind of like placed himself to where here you have a guy that it literally was uh, power hungry like nothing ever felt enough for him and when you're talking specifically uh, about like the mental health of this movie I think it's really easy to talk about Riley and I want to talk about Riley's journey in just a second. But uh, Roland's character in particular is really interesting because I, I think that we in America, like now you have a lot of people that are kind of positioned in that power position where it, they, they achieve a level of success and whether that is, you know, socially, politically, uh, financially, whatever they do, they're always constantly like seeking more. It's like how much is enough and like your kind of happiness is essentially fleeting with that kind of uh, approach to life. Yeah. I mean, like with Roland's character, he was, uh, well, I guess like with a lot of people in general, he was looking for that that next almost high endorphin rush. He was looking for that next pleasure and it turns out not to be what he thought it was, which we hear quite frequently with stories like that of any kind. Yeah. I'm glad you, uh, you mentioned more about his character itself. Cause it, it is an interesting character. Um, of course, uh, Riley being the central, um, character around everything, but, uh, his definitely his, his seeking of pleasure, um, and life itself is, uh, is pain and pleasure, a series of pain and pleasure events that, that happen throughout life. And uh, it's interesting, you know, he regretted uh, his choice as well, uh, which was um, the sensation. Um, and he didn't know what he was getting into. <laughs> For sure. I like, I, I like that fact that uh, he's like, Oh no, <laughs> wait <laughs> and the he finally gets one, his opportunity to mm -hmm. to, to plead <laughs> one of those decisions where it's like you make the decision and it's what have i done once it comes true kind of thing yeah yeah i had a job like that once <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean I, I i was gonna ask like have you guys ever like been in like a position where you felt like you chased after something like really hard and like if you eventually like ended up like regretting it afterwards, I, I think, uh, I know I, I've definitely had, uh, several times in my life where I'm just like, you know what, like, this is what I want. And then I get there and it's just kind of like, this was a really, really terrible experience. And I hope to never, never, ever repeat it. So, yeah, I had, um, in the career path I've been on for like the last 12, 13 years. Um, a company made me an offer with a whole lot of promises and I took them up on it thinking it was going to be a good choice. In the long run, it kind of did because I got experience in the field, but I walked into the place for my first day to sign paperwork and go over to all the stuff. And within minutes of walking in the front door, it was immediate dread and Oh no, what have I done? And it was like four or five years they never kept any of their promises um and it's very if somebody wanted to push the issue they they would have gotten some questions from labor boards for a hostile work environment it was bad it was really bad to the point that i was driving into work every day i was getting migraines and stuff just trying to go to work so frustrated with the place but it worked out because it gave me the experience I needed to move up when I left. So, and it also added perspective to the job and career in general that I didn't have before, which made it easier to kind of better appreciate 
another company. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is like learning from uh, from what we've done and our experiences um, as far as the past, we went, our regrets and stuff like that. Uh, I try to always see the 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 good and everything as far as well. At least I learned something. But I have a couple past relationships where I'm like, oh well, I, this is what I wanted, and now, well, no. <laughs> I think everybody has one of those. Yeah, <laughs> I was at least uh, that, one of those. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, like I I I know I had like past relationships that like I was like, yeah, this this will bring me happiness, and it it doesn't, man, and like uh. If anything, I'll say that like it did more damage to my mental health than like caused things like depression and uh, even like thoughts of suicide. So like uh, I I look at kind of where I am now, being married for eight years, and just kind of been like, man, like I I'm glad that you know I took a I took a chance with someone, and you know has worked out beneficial, and it's been the best eight years of my life, you know, 10 years together. So Uh, it's one of those things that if you look at it as a learning experience, it may have been a shitty experience while you were in it, but it wasn't necessarily a bad one in the long run because you learned from it in the end. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the things that like I've, I've learned to like, appreciate about like my my mental my own mental health journey is that like i have had some really cruddy experiences whether that has been seasons of depression going through anxiety contemplating suicide losing friends to suicide um you know walking away from faith coming back to faith uh you know moving and isolating myself from like people i don't even know and like you know but every i feel like every step that i've i've made has made me a better person in the long run for it like it really sucks like some of the some of the jobs that i've taken in the past have like like really messed up like my mental health and kind of like trust for like future employers but like i think at the end of the day like it i wouldn't change anything about what i've i've gone through because like again i feel like it's made me a stronger person because of it for sure mistakes uh they gave us a lot of uh life experiences and wisdom uh imagine a life without without mistakes it'd be pretty pretty boring and uh not much not much to learn as far as everybody just went on the right the right path that'd be uh, that's actually a strange universe to think about how many good stories how many good stories start (laughs) with here hold my beer i mean no good decisions come from that but A lot of entertainment does. So. Yeah. <laughs> Being able to look back on, on not some stuff, but a lot of stuff and be able to, to find some good or, or laugh at is always good. That's always good for, for the mental health as well, as far as uh, got to find, got to find the light and some, and some of that. Yeah. Flipping your perspective is, is something that I, I feel like is really beneficial. Um I think that like in those moments you're like man like i i hate this now but i know like in a week in a month in a year like i'm gonna look back on this and like i'm gonna learn something like there's a lesson or uh you know call it god call it the universe call it you know whatever divine force you want to call it and say that like someone is trying to like teach me uh something to like you know uh you know love where i'm at or like to you know remind me of like my own self-worth or you know how to be patient or or not to be angry and and just kind of like or like you know shape my identity or you know just a number of other things and it it happens from that that life experience yeah and, and like i said earlier it puts things in perspective so like i mentioned with the job previously i left the company went back to the company I had left to hearing the same stories I heard when I left the company. But at this point, I had this experience under my belt with the other company that I kind of looked at the guys. And these are longtime people in the field, 10, 20, 30 years in the field complaining about, oh, this is horrible. That's horrible. And I just kind of laugh and look at them. It's like, guys, you've been at the same company and the same job so long you've lost perspective. 
what you're complaining about isn't a big deal in the long run, trust me. And it, it puts things in perspective to kind of make you look at things differently. It can happen quick too if you don't take it every once in a while, just step back for a moment and and look at things for sure. You can get lost, lost in that. Uh, I've had to either do it myself or or be put back in place a couple of times in my life for sure. Um, yeah. Perspective is, is something that, that really matters. Um, and there, there's a, there's a particular scene here that uh, I, I don't know how you guys, I I've, I've been kind of low key obsessed with uh, this movie. So it's like, I am like low actually key. looking on low key. looking online. Get out of here, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> We're going I've been with like, low key. Okay. I, I have watched this movie three times. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, anyways, um, we're going with Loki. Uh, I, I kind of like to see like what other people are um, are saying about this movie because uh, I, I think it's... I like to see what other people think about it and kind of like have conversations about like what worked for some people, what didn't work. And uh, I, I think from the common consensus that uh, some of the complaints that people had is like the not having uh, any connection to like Riley or like Matt, Colin, um, Trevor, um, and, and Nora, like there are five main uh, protagonists that we, we kind of follow at circling around. Um, but there's a scene in particular where Matt, who is Riley's brother, uh, you know, kind of like questions her life decisions of, basically like hooking up with trevor and like the backstory of those is like they both of them like they're recovering addicts or at least we're we're, we're led to believe um riley is trevor's kind of like i don't know what to make about him because of his connection to roland but that's neither here nor there uh but i think sometimes like he's that scene is like such a, a powerful scene because it reminds us like sometimes we need that perspective that outside perspective like you think you're on the right path and it's like well well no actually you're not like this this might seem right in the moment but it actually could end up like hurting you it could be toxic to you so like simian like what you just kind of brought up about like having that outside uh force of like looking in is like is really important for for growth and sometimes uh resetting our our, our own steps in the, the paths that we take I didn't have much of an issue with the um, characters not really having much of a backstory. Um, there's tons of horror movies and slashers and stuff that are like that to begin with. Um, they just kind of throw characters into the mix and you're more or less there for say, Michael Myers, Freddy, in this case, the Cenobites. So that's the kind of the way they're more of a plot point to get to the hell priest and the torture. Um, that's kind of the way I viewed them. My big issue, other than what I already said, was some of the taping with the mute movie was extremely dark. And it was hard to make out stuff in some scenes. That was my biggest gripe with the whole movie. Not so much the characters. I, and I'm fine. I'm fine with unlikable characters. Um, give me Riley's whatever. Um, I'm, I'm fine. They're yeah, like you said, they're a device for uh, to propel things usually. But uh, uh, when I mean, there's one issue I had with the character, which was the brother, and uh, it was with the he, he shook hands with the boyfriend after his sister was having like very loud sex. So he knew that they were having sex. And then right afterwards, he shakes his hand. At that moment, I was like, hmm. <laughs> no, that was the questionable. <laughs> that was the one character questionable moment in the whole movie for me. I was like, like was oh. there Purell involved before that handshake? <laughs> <laughs> who, which, who, who in their right mind would do that? That's the only time where I was like, so I pay attention to that stuff a lot too. Cause when I, I go through when I'm, of course, when I'm writing my first draft of my film, it's rough draft and there's going to be mistakes and stuff like that. But I want the audience to, to believe everything that's going on <laughs> within the realm. Right. So you create your own universe and you can create your own rules, but it has to still follow some stuff, some form of believability. But that was the only moment where I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
where has that hand been? <laughs> yeah. Places I do not want to know. Uh, yeah, it's, I've I've had a lot of friends that like watch this movie too, and they're like, "Yeah, like this this movie's lit really really bad," or like there are certain parts that like I just I I I for one like almost every viewing I've had of this movie has been in like pitch black. So like for me like it's not like um there's not like I didn't see parts like that but like also in all fairness there were definitely parts in the night house that I felt like were definitely like too dark. Um and when you're seeing it in a theatrical setting like it doesn't really make a, a difference because like your eyes are are adjusted to that darkness but watching it like at home um in like a, a normal like everyday space that you know you watch like your television shows on and uh you just play video games on like that kind of stuff is like meant for like the small screen it's not intended for the the big screen and so like i i i didn't have a problem with it but i definitely can understand why people say it so well you've you've also seen my home theater indeed i have so that shouldn't have been an issue in my case that's fair it was there was there was a few scenes that were kind of hard to make out what was going on, um, and that again goes back to one of the the issues I had with the dialogue of Pinhead was the way it was like multi voices over top of each other, multiple voices over top of each other. At times, made it a little difficult for me to understand on occasion. But then again, we've brought up the fact that I have a slight hearing impairment, so that could have played Indeed into we it have. as well yeah so there were a few scenes where if you blinked you'd miss something for sure yeah but uh go ahead no i was just the i didn't even realize i didn't even realize the 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 pure uh darkness of it until i heard i heard other people mention as well i was just like really dark and i was and then i was like well i guess so there were a couple scenes where um i was like oh yeah like the van um the van the it was really dark and it was really fast. Yeah. And, and I take, I, I, I've got a big um, 4k TV and everything. And I run the THX um, calibrations on it every now and again. So I know it's not a matter of me having it too dark. <laughs> it yeah. gets adjusted about once a year. So just to make sure everything's right. If a red looks orange, that TV is getting adjusted. So <laughs> it's it, it, I know it was it was the way those certain scenes were shot made it difficult to make out what was going on in a few scenes. Yeah, well, uh, I'm curious to, to hear what you guys think about this, and I, I think that like certain sequences, like what you're talking about, I think where Nora's trapped in the wall is also another great example of that. Yeah. Um, but like, man, this film should have been re- released theatrically, and it like it's not it's like it's no shade of disney like you know do what you're do what you want to do like i i understand but like also this movie i feel like would have probably made a small fortune uh just from curiosity alone that's right disney does own this don't they which also makes because jamie clayton is a female this makes Pinhead, a Disney princess. princess. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, so is the alien queen and Ripley. Yeah. Yeah. Got to throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> Curiosity itself is part of the box too, which is kind of interesting. But yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would have just wanted to check it out, uh, if not fans of uh, a Bruckner, but just the franchise itself. Or uh, oh, let's see, let's see what they can do with this. Um, I, I, it definitely would not have hurt. Uh, I don't think the box office uh, with that type of thing. And what's what's happening right now, as far as uh, as certain other movies are starting to get a little bit um, a little bit more light on that type of stuff is uh, uh, it's that's a tough one, right? I don't who's you get you're at the mercy. And is it like an indie filmmaker? Yeah. Like uh, I don't even know what that's like, but. Um, I can imagine what that's like. Um, and I kind of try to put myself in perspective too, is like the, 
the darkness of things. As any filmmaker, though, I would use that to hide something, something I didn't have the budget for. <laughs> and I did <laughs> a but, couple times. I mean, it would have been interesting to have seen in a theater, but I don't think it had the scale of something like Nope, which benefits from the theater, um, especially IMAX, which we've discussed, or like um dune last year how badly it was negatively affected by a home release instead of doing a theatrical release he openly stated why he was so upset with hbo for releasing dune last year on streaming was because he designed and shot the movie for theaters and imax i don't think this is one of those movies that would have had that major benefit from it but it might have helped in the long run for box office some I I agree and I disagree both at the same time. I think that I think the front half of this movie where you're dealing with a lot of the subjects of addiction and you have the mystery of the box, I don't necessarily think that those are like cinematically uh equipped to kind of like serve as a reason to place this on the big screen, but I think the back half of this movie more than makes up for it and 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 makes it that cinematic experience like i i feel like the way that uh i i know you think she's just okay but jamie clayton in this movie is like i i she ign put a comment out about this movie and said that like there's an entire like she will be the the pinhead for this generation and i i absolutely agree with that i think that she will do for this franchise what Doug Bradley did for the the uh the late eighties. And I, I think that like that more than justifies a, a big screen release. I am extremely envious of people that got to see this at uh I think this played at at Frightmare, um uh the like the popcorn frights down in Orlando. I think this played in uh Fantastic Fest, Beyond Fest. I'm so jealous of people who got to see this on the big screen. Um, because I, I think both this and Prey were robbed of a big screen deliverance. Yeah, I think it was a, a secret screening at Fantastic Fest, if I'm not mistaken. So jealous of that. Yeah, yeah I think you're right though. Yeah. Yeah, it it I mean it would have done well. I just think it would have felt like just about like any other movie on the big screen. I don't really think it would have been the same experience as some of the other things that have come out over the years. I think it's the box office reception of really the last two films that kind of hurt this because the reason that Prey didn't get a box office or yeah, a, a big screen treatment was because of how, how poorly the predator underperformed at the box office. When you go back and you look at how uh, the bloodline and hell on earth did uh, not to mention the fact that we got six straight to DVD sequels. I don't, I think this is kind of like, um, I think this is the reason why I got dumped on the streaming is because like, I think they underestimated the fandom, but also at the same time, I think that they just didn't have enough faith in uh, the 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 film to kind of really set it up. And I, I really hope I'm wrong. I really hope that, you know, for they reconsider and bring future uh, Prey and Hellraiser sequels to the big screen and not limit them to uh, to streaming. Um, because I think that, you know, the fact that we're seeing, you know, I think Prey was like Hulu's like number one, like premiere of the year. I think, uh, I've seen so many people tweet about this movie. I, I think it would be a, a great disservice if you're going to do future follow-ups to not place them on the big screen. Yeah. I feel like Bruckner met kind of, uh, met them halfway on it. I kind of get that feeling as well, especially yeah. with the night house originally being, um, written as a Hellraiser movie, and they weren't they weren't going to let him do it. Um, so then he rewrote it for the Night House, which uh, is a great standalone movie by itself. Anyway, but and then he's like, oh, "Are they going to let me do a Hellraiser movie?" That's I'm just trying to think <laughs> of what his frame of mind is. But he's like, "Are they going to let me do it? Where well, we're gonna we're gonna do it?" But here's the the stipulations, and then he's like, "Okay, okay." Uh, I mean, 
you also had over the last couple of years the rise of releasing to Netflix and Amazon. Uh, how many major movies have come out straight to Netflix and Amazon and stuff over the last few years? So they were no longer having to compete with the theater. So now you have the streaming service exclusives to bring in more viewers. And I think that played yeah. into it as well. Yes, but the two that the two distributors that you just named, both Netflix and Amazon, have taken bigger releases and given them small theatrical runnings. Um and so like I even if this movie played in like one theater uh like in the state for like two weeks, I would have loved to see this on the big screen. Just just throwing that out there. And and I know he would have wanted it on a big screen too. Like <laughs> yeah, any filmmaker absolutely. any filmmakers like I would rather have my film on the big screen than a streaming service. Uh, I can gar- almost guarantee that. Yeah. <laughs> as far as uh, but it's it's still a nice thing. I mean, to be on a major streaming platform too. It's like yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of, kind of a six of one, half dozen of the other. Yeah. So. One of the one of the last things I, I feel like uh, I would be reminiscent not to talk about, especially being a mental health podcast, is uh. Riley's um, addiction journey in this movie and really also like how uh, sensitive the, the recovery journey is for uh, those in mental health um, or sorry, the mental health of those in recovery. Um, I've, a, I've a lot, of, a lot of friends and I've had some family that have gone through recovery and it is a lot like uh, kind of walking a tightrope sometimes where you have to hold people accountable, but also at the same time, like uh, not necessarily just kind of let them like walk all over you. And I think the, the scene where Matt kicks Riley out is a really, really great example of this where she has been clean for six months and it's this fight that ultimately causes her to relapse, not being with Trevor, not being uh, around other recovering addicts, but this uh, this singular moment where uh, Matt, you know, has like this like fear of the unknown because like from someone that has watched people go through that, it is kind of terrifying to uh, walk that t- tightrope where you're like, all right, you're in recovery, which is awesome but also at the same time is like i i don't know you know if you if you do like go back to this drug of choice like is this going to be the end of your life it's a really terrifying tight rope to to walk so that experience is different from person to person it's never going to be the same absolutely yeah for anybody um and that's the first thing to get out there. It's never going to be the same, but I don't think that was her first, the major relapse or anything in that movie because the boyfriend, when they show them at his apartment, he's got bongs everywhere. They're drinking heavily and all that stuff. So the way they make Riley out to be, she never really quit in the first place. Yes. But I also like, I also bring Trevor in like Trevor's like, quote unquote recovery into question because of like his connection to like Roland at the end of the movie oh, where yeah. it, it's kind of like oh she was just supposed to be a mark which it it's really easy to like set like people in the recovery community up to be that way because like you know they are they're really fragile and they're really uh, vulnerable and they're in continued in that vulnerable uh, state. And the box itself is almost like a, a symbol. There's a parallel there as a, a symbol of addiction. Um, yeah. The pleasures, uh, the pleasures you seek bring pain upon yourself and others. Um, I found that really interesting. I like that the aspect of it um, made a really Riley's character even more powerful to me as in that in that aspect. If you really look at it, um, but, yeah, and it's at, at the same time that whole argument between Riley and her brother. At a certain point, sometimes you do kind of have to say enough's enough. Like in you that do case, because it, 
at, at the end of the day, you have to protect your own mental health. And you have to say, like, all right, like, I've poured out as much as I can pour out. Like, clearly, this person is not reciprocating anything. And I have to take care of, of my own thing because at the end of the day, you have to you have to ask yourself, like, how much am I willing to sacrifice so that this person will uh, in the hopes that this person will stay clean or that they won't die and go back to drugs? At the same time, though, he, he they have the argument he kicks her out and kind of enough's enough kind of thing. But at the same time, you can be overly critical overly harsh and judgmental and may cause to just be like what's the point if well, what's the point of me continuing Great, yeah I mean it propelled things really quickly yeah um, that that moment the catalyst um, created everything the, the this quickly made her give up as well he gave up on her she gave up on herself yeah yeah. It was one of those moments where it just, what's the point? Yeah. And so. I, I, I did feel that as far as like, uh, that was very believable as far as, uh, the situation itself. Um, I mean, uh, if the people you're trying to, that you're close to, if they give up on you, then what else do you have? And when you're in, when you're in dark times like that, so. Yeah. And I, I, to go back to something that you had talked about, Earlier, Simeon, with the the box kind of being like a symbol of addiction, um, I read an interview um, that Bruckner did in the, the the press tour for this, and kind of talked about like the the parallels uh, to addiction and kind of like what the box representing, like you know, looking for that ultimate kind of like form of pleasure in the flesh. And I think they they absolutely kind of nailed that, and like I said, I, I've. I've unfortunately had to watch a lot of like people I care about go through that uh, addiction slash recovery uh, phase. And it's, it's exactly like you're searching for the box. You're always constantly looking for that, that next high or that next um, thing. And, and, and sometimes uh, you, you replace that addiction and, and you, you get away from the less healthy uh, side of it. And then other times you're just, you just kind of re recycle and um it, it's 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 a journey that is different for everyone like you said mark yeah the person can quickly lose sight of who they're hurting uh along that as well uh, and absolutely in some, in some cases it's not even lose sight of it's not important mm -hmm. yeah yeah, because that that vice or whatever it it is like just becomes the the singular focus for that individual. Um, hello, Scooby. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. Um, but I, I again, if you or someone you know is, is just going through this, you're with your depression or addiction or or self harm. Uh, there is uh a our links to our mental health resource library in the descriptions below. Um, but that's going to do it for us on this episode of Abyss Gazing. Uh, Simeon, one more time, where can people follow you? I'm uh, just going to uh, find me on Instagram, Simeon underscore Gregory, or uh, go to deathinabox.film, and I'll have uh, all the updates on that film. And then uh, I've got another one in the works, too, so I'm casting for it right now. Nice. And uh, Mark, where can people find you online? Um, I need to update my Instagram again because it's been a few <laughs> months. <laughs> but uh, just my my painting miniatures and stuff on Instagram, Titanium Juggernaut Painting. Well, you guys can follow me. I'm uh, on Letterboxd at Captain Nostalgia. You guys can follow me on TikTok at uh, Gent Ghostface, G-E-N-T. And you guys can follow our parent company, Victims and Villains. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, and wherever you guys get your podcasts from, all of which you guys can find in the descriptions below. Until next time, remember that the... Uh, others... Blah, blah, blah. Issues. We're going to leave you... Yeah.
We're going to leave you guys this week with uh, the theme or the song to uh, Simeon's short film. The song is called Death in the Box, and the artist is known as McCain Music. We'll provide a link for uh, their more of their, their music in the descriptions below as well. So until next time, remember that the more that you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes back into you. <laughs>